Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. I remember the first time I walked into a mainline Christian church. It was an unusual experience for me, figuring out when to stand and when to sit, listening to the Lord's Prayer for the first time. Even the public pronouncement of cares and concerns, taking time for greeting one another, and a coffee hour following worship were all new to me. But what surprised me most was what happened after worship. Because on the way out of the building, I was handed a palm frond. I had no idea what the symbol meant or what I was supposed to do with it. When we celebrate with the palm fronds, it isn't just a hollow tradition. It has religious and political meaning behind it. The unusualness to me represented a kind of Jesus that I did not know. One who was different from what I was used to and was celebrated and worshiped in a way different, in a way that was strange and new to me. This Jesus wasn't apolitical. He was fierce in his devotion to justice, which surpasses all the divisions the world erects between the spiritual and the concrete. Last week, as part of the discernment process, I completed a course in church polity, where we examined the structure of religious hierarchies, the various roles that clergy take in different aspects of worship, and the history of congregational worship from the pilgrims to the present. My confusion holding those palm fronds 10 years ago came to my mind vividly as I considered how worship tradition and ceremony shapes our lives and guides us along our spiritual journeys. The Jesus I was raised with was a meek, simple teacher, a man destined to sacrifice his perfection to atone for the sins of all humanity. Jesus was a healer and teacher, but most of all, he was a person only concerned with thoughts of heaven. Jesus would return with a flaming sword to separate the wheat from the chaff, but only because he was the arbiter of who deserved to be saved and who would be condemned to an eternity in darkness. The Jesus I study now that I embrace now is the living word of God who teaches us the complexity and challenge of live, loving ourselves and each other as God does. Jesus as the Christ makes demands of us because love is not only an emotion, it is also a way of being in the world that requires honesty, kindness, and fearlessness. This is a Jesus whose compassion encompasses all of human existence and is concerned not only with the state of our souls, but also with how we respond and treat one another in our daily lives. You don't talk much about the early Jesus followers, situatedness in Rome and what that meant. Jesus was using the symbology of Rome against itself when he entered into Jerusalem. It was more active, more politically involved Jesus than is commonly understood. The palm fronds remind us of a time that Jesus made a political as well as a religious statement. As pointed out by Obi Hendricks in The Politics of Jesus, the act of riding into Jerusalem on a donkey made a mockery of the pomp and circumstance afforded to earthly rulers. As opposed to the Roman victory parade called a triumph, Jesus enters in a state of humility, pointing toward a system of values which often refuses to be translated into occasions which honor worldly strength and the violence of domination. It was only a short time before Jesus' birth that Herod was made to parade through the streets of Rome under a banner declaring him a conquered vassal of Pompeii. Herod was installed as king of the Jews only after he was defeated and humiliated. Only after he was made to witness the public adulation of his conqueror. 
the conquering of Jesus as the Christ would not be heralded by the corpses of vanquished foes or the ceremonial spectacle of defeated monarchs made to be paraded before the people of Rome. Jesus came to defeat the ultimate enemy, death itself. This aspect of Jesus's mission of using soul power or the power of religion to critique and contextualize the political has been made manifest over the last two weeks. We witnessed the band of violent extremists attack the very foundations of our democratic society while they carried crosses and prayed on the floor of the Capitol building. These rioters represent the imperialistic white supremacist understanding of power that results from violence and hatred. We witnessed many instances where these insurrectionists intermingled the divinity of God with the presidency of Donald Trump, an act of desecration which still offends me every time I think about it. We witnessed a large group convened to promote hatred while steadfastly ignoring hundreds of thousands of deaths through the mere action of gathering without face masks. These are the aspects and acts of dominance and white supremacy, which not only use God's name in vain, but also call for us to remember Jesus as the embodiment of justice. In his ministry, we see the reality of God's presence and our love and care for one another. And as an overt challenge to displays and uses of power, which deny the inherent value of life and the equity of all beings. The circumstances of this time in our nation's history condition the transfer of power rooted in the symbology of death, overcoming, and compassion. For me, the most potent symbol this week were the 400 lights positioned around the reflecting pole in our nation's capital. One light for every thousand lives lost to the pandemic. How do we make sense of death and terror that haunts this nation? And those of us who call this nation home. How do we embrace love as transformative and powerful when anger fills our hearts? Today's readings help us to sort through the complex emotions, fears, and hopes of moments like these. It speaks to what really matters in our everyday struggles for a more just world and to live into the life of faith. I've always loved the book of Psalms. Most of them are attributed to King David writing at various stages of his life. For me, the complex character of David, chosen and anointed king of, of Israel, lover of Jonathan, a carrier of God's justice, murderer and villain. Also spoke to the complexity we take to the praise of God in our imperfections and glories. The boy who slayed Goliath grows to be a ruler and conqueror. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people Israel. This is a conqueror who is nevertheless forbidden from building a temple for God due to his history of violence. First Chronicle says, you have shed much blood and have waged great wars. You shall not build a house to my name because you have shed so much blood in my sight on the earth. In the Psalms, we see David struggling with his relationship with God, with the shape his life has taken and the constant death and insurrection was to find his kingdom. The psalmist writes, for God alone, my soul waits in silence, for my hope is from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. My refuge is in God. Over the last week, I've taken great security in this song. Our society rejects patience and quietude, but it is only when we take the time to understand and develop our own emotions, desires, and gifts 
that we are able to hear God speaking into the silence. Here, I am referring to the patience of a carpenter who works constantly toward men with the understanding that progress is often difficult at times to perceive. Ours is an act of patience rooted in our faith. We constantly and consistently move toward justice despite the mountains of hatred which stand in our path. Because we know that our living God can move mountains. David continues, trust in him at all time, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. We can never trust those in power to listen to the better angels of their natures, but we can depend on the love of God to see us through difficult times. The hope in God is a hope for justice, that things will be made right, if not in our lives, than in the divinely sanctioned order of being. This is not an imperial sense of victory based in domination or revenge. It is a sense of justice which flows from the love of God. This is a Jesus victory which comes in God's time and often in surprising ways. A few months ago, my wife asked me if I loved Donald Trump. She was wondering if the love I preach and study is a sufficient force to combat the hatred and violence which suffuses our society. I had to think long on the question and the answer that came to my heart surprised me. Eventually I answered that I love Trump so much that I hope he is forcefully removed from office and made to stand trial for his crimes. I hope that all his money is taken from him and his family, that Trump has to confront himself without the hairstylists and makeup artists and sycophants, that he has to confront himself in the full nakedness of his humanity, that all the delusions which are attached to his racism, hatred of women and immigrants, and contempt for the poor and disinherited will fall from his eyes and the reality of God's love will shine forth. The psalmist sings, those of lowest state are but a breath. Those of high state are a delusion. In the balances they go up, they are together lighter than a breath. Put no confidence in extortion and set no main hopes on robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. Before God, we are stripped of all the defenses and pretenses we use to survive and thrive in a world given to white supremacy and avarice. One of my professors used to tell us that justice is what love looks like in public. I'll say that again. Justice is what love looks like in public. The love of God is directly connected to how we choose to shape our public and political lives. Power, privilege, wealth, these are all things which can be taken from you. God's love is constant. We can reject it, but it can never be taken from us. It is important to remember that justice, public and political love, saves not only the oppressed, but the oppressor as well. For those who have rejected the love of God, and of their fellow humans, it is only through seeking forgiveness, granting restitution, and engaging in, in the complex process of reconciliation that one can enter into relation with the divine. Many of the Psalms are David's way of expressing his movement from and journey back to God. He writes, power belongs to God and steadfast love belongs to you, O Lord for you repay all according to their work. What you do matters, how you love your neighbor matters, because love is not only a private emotion, but a way of living which promotes and sustains a just world in which all are able to fully be themselves in God's creation. I want to, want, I want to speak to one more experience I had the night of the inauguration. 
I had the privilege of watching my wife, a black woman, witness the swearing in of Kamala Harris. Amanda put her pearls on and was brought to tears as she watched a black woman, a woman of Jamaican and South Asian heritage, be sworn in as leader of our nation. Look at God work. A man has spent the last few weeks administering COVID vaccines, running a pharmacy full of fearful and anxious patients and trying to protect her own spiritual, physical and emotional health. All of this work while keeping one eye on the daily news where videos of rampant disregard for human life, progress and equality are rife. It is hard to be patient in the face of white supremacy to seek to feel love for those that hate your very being, to trust in the process of justice and redemption, which will come to all of us in due time. Again, our patience is active. Jesus followers must be hard-headed, but not hard-hearted. It took centuries to create the global structure of white supremacist imperialism, and it will take time to deconstruct it. But we, will, but we will run this race and not grown weary. When we depend on the strength of God in addition to our own, we thrive and grow strong. But just as Jesus entering in Jerusalem, our humility and steadfastness are our outward signs of our devotion to the work of God in the world. We live into our callings and identities and hopes, despite the rage of the world, hoping to turn us vengeful and impatient the humility of our everydayness, carrying on in God's love every day, mirrors Jesus' trust in the ability of God, to quote another professor of mine, to snatch victory from defeat. Our triumph is ultimately in God. Those of low state are but a breath. Those of high state are a delusion. In the balances they go up, they are together lighter than a breath. Put no confidence in extortion and set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God and steadfast love belongs to you, O Lord, for you repay all according to their work. Amanda Gorman put it this way. We will rebuild, reconcile and recover. In every known nook of our nation, in every corner called our country, our people diverse and beautiful will emerge, battered and beautiful. When day comes, we step out of the shade, aflame and unafraid. The new dawn blooms as we free it, for there is always light. If only we are brave enough to see it, if only we are brave enough to be it. Are we brave enough to be, to be people of God? Are we brave enough to trust in God's love and the justice that will surely come? To walk and live in humility, secure in God's will. My prayer for all of us over coming weeks is that we remember what it means to accept the palms every day. That we always remember what it is to see God working in the world to be followers of Jesus. Amen.